My name is Nicola, aka Socrates, and you're watching Singularity FM, the place where we interview the future. If you guys enjoy this podcast, you can help me make it better by either writing a brief review on iTunes or by simply going to interviewthefuture.com and becoming a patron. Today, my guest on the show is Dr. David Ferrucci. Dr. Ferrucci was the team leader behind IBM's Watson, and we had a fantastic conversation on that topic about seven and a half years ago. So if you haven't seen that interview, then I suggest you go and check it out because I will try not to repeat any of the questions that I asked Dr. Ferrucci last time. His time is very valuable. So my plan is that today our conversation would have three main parts. First, I want to play a little catch up with Dr. Ferrucci about what happened in the last seven and a half, eight years and perhaps what did not happen in the world of AI. Then I want to talk about the, the present, which in his case is called Elemental Cognition, which is Dr. Ferrucci's latest venture. And finally, I want to turn our look towards the future and talk about the next five and perhaps 10 years and what we're seeing on the horizon of artificial intelligence. So without further ado, welcome back to Singularity FM, David. I'm so happy to talk to you. Hi, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Fantastic. So it's been almost eight years since I last had you on the show. And first, I want to ask you about perhaps acquiring a new perspective. You know, eight years is a sufficiently, it's almost a decade, it's a long time. So has your perspective on IBM's Watson changed in any substantial way or not? Um. I think that you know my perspective toward and you know, how do we invest in AI and what we want out of it certainly has been evolving. I think if you go back to the Watson days, the challenge at the time was this open domain fact, open domain factoid question answering. You know, how do we take an arbitrary factoid based question, regardless of how it's phrased or articulated, and sort of nail the answer? And do that in a way where the system sort of knows what it knows or what it doesn't know. There is like produce a, a good confidence in its answer. Jeopardy was a great way to test and drive that. But since then, there's been a tremendous amount of development in the field that I that um, where where we've advanced language processing capabilities with machine learning tremendously. So that's you know that's certainly involved my thinking. But the other thing that has happened, which is something that I was painfully aware of during the Watson days, is that in spite of being able to perform this task, the system's really not developing an understanding of what it's reading. And, and, and ultimately, I think that's what we want out of AI. We want AI to be able to read, understand, and communicate with us in sort of rational, consumable ways. And this became more and more of my, my focus as the, year has gone, as the years have gone by, as machine learning has been advancing, we've been taking advantage of it in many really cool ways, but we're still not solving that problem. And I think, and I think painfully aware of that with Watson, even more so now, um, as we figure out how do we create hybrid architectures that take advantage of that the statistical machine learning, but start to target this notion of a deeper understanding of what they're reading. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So how do you feel perhaps there were a couple of reports that came out about uh, medical trials involving IBM's Watson trying to to work uh, either together with uh, medical teams or on its own in terms of uh, diagnosis medical diagnosis and a few other applications and I read a couple of reports that were very sort of uh, how should I put it uh, condemning of, of Watson's capacity to, to even offer any kind of assistance. And my understanding is that both of those trials got canceled. Uh, and, and basically the verdict at, uh, at that time, which was about a year ago, I think, was that it's kind of been somewhat overhyped and it doesn't have quite the capacity or the capability to offer any help within the medical field at this point in time. How do you feel about that? I can't speak to the particulars of those of those things, obviously, because I wasn't involved in, in the projects. I wasn't at IBM, but more 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 generally, it sort of depends what you're trying to do with it. Clearly, the technology is limited in the sense that it's not understanding everything it's reading. 
It's not, you know, it's not the same thing as a doctor picking up a journal, reading and understanding and reasoning about that content. It's still, you know, it, the basic technology, Watson and other technologies like it are still operating with language at a fairly shallow level. Now, that's also not, not you know, that's also you want to distinguish the notion of using machine learning in general to um, train on data and, and make predictions. And I think that that's possible to do. Watson, at least when I left it in, in the end of 2012, was principally about language processing. And, um, you know, to expect that language processing was act actually deep, deeply understanding the content and reasoning about it, if that's what your expectation was for solving a problem, you know, you weren't there. I mean, we, we, we were, of course, aware of that. What we demonstrated was that we can use um, a combination of natural language processing and machine learning and the right architectures and approaches to solve the open domain question answering problem represented by Jeopardy, which was, you know, very challenging at the time. But, but again, it's easy to look at some of these AI uh, pr uh, problems or these AI feats, if you will, and then draw this line that says, oh, if you can do this, then if a human were able to play Jeopardy, that means they could read and understand anything. And that, and, and that comparison is, is, is false, right? That comparison doesn't work. You got the machine to do it in a way that isn't necessarily analogous to the way the human does it, and it doesn't inherit the same properties. Yeah, and even in our previous conversation, you were very specific of uh, sort of laying out the two extremes between like, uh, you know, uh, Watson can do absolutely everything and uh, oh, Watson is like nothing new, nothing unique because of course computers know everything already. Right. So you're very good at laying out those two extremes and saying how both of them are false and both of them kind of fail to capture or understand what Watson actually is and why is it an, an accomplishment and in what sense it is an accomplishment. Right. So so now that 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 you know you've had this eight years to sort of let this sort of sink in the effect and the impact perhaps what is it that you're most proud of with with this project with i'm um, sorry with elemental cognition or no with, no with watson uh, that's with watson? the last question on watson and then we're moving on yeah so i mean look i mean at, at the time I, I guess what i'm most proud of is at the time we took on a challenge that nobody knew how to do and um, we put together a team and, a, and an approach. We were really um, amongst very few who believed it was even possible within, outside, within uh, IBM and outside of IBM. And uh, we figured it out and we solved it. And it was, you know, it was, it was fabulous in that sense from, from an AI accomplishment perspective, both in terms of the talent and the determination and and the science and the engineering that you know that went in that went into it. I think from a purely technical perspective, we learned a ton about uh, about NLP, about the application of machine learning, about using a successive pi successive pipeline of, of machine learning models, about the entire uh, about the entire process of how to rapidly accelerate uh, you know a project like that. Um, because relatively speaking, we set that goal and we did it, you know, we did it quite, you know, quickly. We wrote about, I don't know, somewhere around 25 or 30 papers on on what we did and how it worked. So I was very proud, you know, proud of that on on multiple levels. At the same time, as I, you know, as we just talked about, one of the things that was lacking was this desire, at least my personal desire, to, to while we solve that, you know, that AI task. How do we get machines to really understand what, what they read in a deep way that is compatible with how humans build and reason over what they read? And that's a very different kind of problem. And AI has still not gotten there. And that's sort of what drove me to do the elemental cognition work. I see. Excellent. So, so, so let's trace sort of your journey. Uh, well, actually, before we start about your personal journey and, and moving on, perhaps I want to touch on, on a couple of milestones, also other milestones. So uh, Watson came to be, and it was like this huge benchmark. Ray Kurzweil, of course, came in and said immediately, you see, there you have, you have, you had uh, Deep Blue, now you have Watson, you know, the singularity is near, right? Uh, and then... The next benchmark uh, on that sort of Ray Kurzweilian timeline, of course, was first AlphaGo and then uh, AlphaZero. 
So first of all, what's your take on AlphaGo and AlphaZero? Because there were many experts who, I think the uh, the complication of, of uh, Go is something like 10 to the 16th. Uh, in other words, there are more uh, combinations of moves in Go than there are particles in the known universe. And so experts were saying, first, we're never going to accomplish that milestone. And second, if we do, we're going to need some kind of a monstrosity of supercomputer, quantum computer, uh, brute force power that we didn't see any time nearly on the horizon. And yet... There we go. We did it just a few years after Watson. So what's your take on all that? I think that was a huge accomplishment. And I think there was a tremendous um, demonstration of what you know, machine learning can do. And I, and I think there were some brilliant approaches to figuring out how to generate sufficient training data by getting the machine to play itself uh, you know, until you know, learn what, you know, what it was doing under wins and losses and so forth. So I think the whole project was brilliant. I think the result was a real demonstration of how machine learning can be used to solve these, this class of problem. Um, I think it's also still a demonstration, too, of how um, machine learning creates, you know, I use the word an alien intelligence in the sense that it figures out how to solve a problem, but it may figure that, that out in a, in a way that is ultimately not consumable by humans. And in some sense, this really is. I mean, it, it sounds like a, it sounds like a, a you know, you know, a, a reckless term in some sense, but it really is kind of an alien intelligence. I mean, it's solving a problem um, that, you know, we consider difficult, that if humans can do it, humans would be real, you know, really intelligent, but it's solving it in a way where it can't turn around and say to you, hey, here's how I'm doing it, and I can teach you how I'm doing it, right? So in, in, in a real sense, it's sort of an alien intelligence. And not to be discarded, but in fact, to, to kind of marvel at it and then say, wow, we can use this for lots of things, but we have to be aware that whatever conceptualization or understanding it's building under the hood is not directly consumable to us. And we, we have to figure out how are we going to deal with that? And in some cases, that's unacceptable. In other cases, that might be okay. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then, so, so we had Watson, we had AlphaGo and AlphaZero, huge benchmarks. Uh, those things were not expected to happen, both of them. Lots of skeptical experts before Watson, before AlphaGo, yet they did happen. Was there something that you thought or other people around you thought that will happen in the last eight years, but unfortunately, looking back, it never did? Well, I, I, you know, I, I think that there was, again, going back to what you were saying about some of the hype around Watson, I think there really was this mistake I think we've, we've repeatedly made about AI, whereas we look at the accomplishments on these narrow tasks and we sort of draw that line and we say, wow, if you can do that, that means you can do this. And then we learn that it's just not a smooth function like that. Um, that the intelligence itself does, you know, when, we, when we think of general intelligence, we say, oh, general intelligence is coming, it's right around the corner because of this. That's not, it's just not clear that that's the case. And I don't think we understand that deeply enough. I don't think we understand how to get from where we are on these narrow tasks to this notion of, uh, to this notion of general intelligence. So I think that's a, a break. Um, and I think we all, and I think everyone is, is, uh, is wary about that. It's easy to draw that line. It's, the reality is more complicated than that. Well, I I don't think Ray Kurzweil is wary of that. He's writing the follow-up to his book called The Singularity is Nearer. Uh, and of course, he's going to use both Watson and AlphaGo and a few other things as uh, evidence that it is nearer, not further. So... Well, look, I mean, there, there are certainly indicators. I mean, it sounds like we're shooting around the right target. How quickly we're going to get there, I think, is still needs to be determined. Yeah. Okay. Great. So, so you are there at this kind of seminal accomplishment with Watson. And then I, I'm trying to understand you're kind of like accomplishing a pinnacle of a career. You're a pretty young guy. You're already accomplished something that most thought it's impossible. What do you, do you do next and why do you decide to move away from IBM? So um, it was a very tough, it was a very tough decision. I think that you know where I was was I, I I very much wanted to understand more deeply 
what it means to apply this sort of technology. And I was already very concerned about, let's, let me generally call it the understanding problem, right? So there's the idea that we can, we can use these techniques, we can make predictions, we can produce answers, but can we produce consumable theories, consumable rational models that can explain uh, what, what the machine is doing and why it's doing it? Because when I imagined, you know, when I imagine artificial intelligence, I want to help me. I, I want a machine not just to pop out an answer. Rather, I want the machine to say, look, here's how I've been thinking about this. I'm weighing these different alternatives. Uh, the model in which I'm, I'm using works like this. Here's how I think the problem, you know, what the causal relationships are, what the causal model is. Here's how I think the system works. Because that enhances my understanding, allows me to make better decisions, and ultimately allows me to rationalize, justify, and be responsible for you know, the outcomes. And when I think about applications, whether they be in the medical space or they're in the finance space or in the legal space or in the policy uh, uh, you know, space, that's what I, that's what I want. I, I want to be able to rationalize and probe and interrogate the machine's logic. At the same time, that's a usually challenging problem. It has historically been a usually challenging problem. You know, we've always faced this notion of the knowledge acquisition bottleneck, which is you can't sit there and just encode all this stuff. It's too brittle and too slow and constantly changing. And you really have to focus on a learning approach. But if you focus on too shallow a learning approach, you end up, you know, with predictions where the explanations are ultimately not there. So... So I very much wanted to focus on that. And then you sit there, well, gee, how the hell do you end up in, you know, in, in, a, in a, you know, a financial institution? What was interesting <laughs> was that uh, Bridgewater is unique amongst financial institutions in that their approach to, to markets and to management in general is what they, you know, what, what, what we phrase at Bridgewater is fundamental and systematic, meaning that any prediction that their machines make they want to make sure that the that those predictions, those answers, are based in a theoretical explanation, a fundamental and systematic explanation. This doesn't mean they don't use data. Of course, they use data. Uh, they're awash in data, but ultimately, their 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 machines are logical in nature. They're producing predictions that can be that can be explicable and consumable by you know by the human. So, we had a tremendous so um, we had a tremendous synergy in, in, with regard to that. They wanted to say, look, we want to use advanced tech, but we insist that we have these explicable models. So that was very interesting to me and very aligned with where I was, you know, you know, at the time. And um, and it just kind of fit a bunch, uh, for a bunch of other reasons. And so that's where I, 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 I ended up at the I guess that was at the very end of 2012. Mm -hmm. That's very fascinating to me you know because of course i had a few people on my show after that happened and of course people uh, uh experts in the field who said stuff like you know the smartest people unfortunately always end up you know working for wall street so you have all the physicists all the the brilliant mathematicians they all become quants uh, and now david is another great example everybody is going to Wall Street and it's kind of like a waste of talent in a way. But what, what you're telling me is actually, and what's fascinating to me is that uh, Bridgewater is not interested in how the world is and how it would be so that they can just make a profit of it, but also of having a theory of how the world the world works uh, so that you have a um, sort of like an, an ongoing formula, if you will, where you can plug in the data and come out with the output, not just like statistical probabilities and stuff like that. Is that correct? To right. They're very focused on developing an understanding and ultimately producing explicable models. And, and, and this synergy sort of drove our relationship. And in fact, I, I think their commitment to that in, in the way they operate, but in addition to the way they think about technology and actually about the role and the of artificial intelligence society, it, it, you know, is similar. Um, recognizing you know, the tremendous power of machine learning, but saying ultimately our models have to be explicable and consumable by human intelligence. It, again, not in all cases, but it, it's a fundamental need. Um, and, and that's actually what, what drove their interest in elemental cognition. So elemental cognition became something that that was exciting to to, kind of, to both of us, to both to both me as well as the Bridgewater. 
Mm -hmm. You know, that reminds me, I had Noam Chomsky and uh, unfortunately, probably the last interview of Dr. Marvin Minsky before he passed away, right after I had you on the show. And both of them uh, were unimpressed by Watson. Um, and the reason was precisely what you said. It's, it's interesting that what you said reminded me of them. Uh, Dr. Minsky said that he didn't see how Watson had any applicability for uh, artificial general intelligence. And he said that, in fact, less people work today on AGI than at his day. And because there was no overarching theory of mind, as he put it. And then Dr. Chomsky, in turn, said, and I'm going to quote here, uh, about also the lack of that kind of theory or over, overarching theory. And he said, quote, what's a program? A program is a theory. It's a theory written in an arcane complex notation designed to be executed by the machine. What about the program, you ask? The same questions you ask about any other theory. Does it give insight and understanding? These theories don't. He's talking about Watson here. So what we're asking here is, can we design a theory of being smart? And the answer is, we're eons away from doing that. So that's that's. Yeah, so Chomsky. anyway, look, I think the the, I think by and large those are good criticisms. I I think I would agree uh, that you know Watson wasn't doing that. Now, of course, that wasn't our that wasn't our charter uh, when we did Watson. There was a there was a problem there that had not been solved before. Uh, we came up with a way to solve it, and we advanced along a number of different dimensions. But you're right. In fact, in some sense, it was another proof point that says, here's this task that's associated with human intelligence. I could find a way to do it with a computer, and, and I'm still unimpressed with the nature of the intelligence that comes out. Um, and and so I agree with those criticisms. I don't have... They, those are, let me be specific, they were not criticizing you per se, well, because... Can't. But they, understood, they were criticizing more like Ray Kurzweil, who's using that as a benchmark on his timeline right. to say, you and, see? And I think that's a fair criticism. Um, I, um, and, and, it's, and it's important to reflect on. I, I, don't, I don't know that um, there were eons away, though, from developing sort of a, a theory about how humans build an understanding. And um, there has been actually a lot of thought on that. It hasn't been meaningful, you know, effectively materialized in, 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 in a general purpose system yet. It's closer to what we're trying to do with elemental cognition, actually. I certainly don't think we're eons away. We have to make, we have to recognize what we want and make the right investments. If we keep making the wrong investments, it'll certainly go more slowly. Um, and that, that's where the interesting questions and the interesting debate becomes. How do you want to get there? What, what, what approach is actually going to work? Okay, so that's the perfect point, perhaps, where we can sort of sag away to elemental cognition then. So you are done with IBM, you moved to Bridgewater, you're at the biggest hedge fund, and you're interested in sort of getting an overarching theory or at least an understanding of how the world works for a number of variety of reasons, scientific reasons, perhaps market sort of beneficial reasons, and so on and so on. Where does elemental cognition come in and why? Why didn't you just stay at Bridgewater and do what you're doing with elemental cognition? Well, I mean, I think that, um, so the, the main reason is that, I, in fact, I, I continue to, to, to do work at Bridgewater, but I mean, I think the, the main reason is, uh, you know, what was driving me for years and still is, is this notion of a general intelligence that could read, understand, and fluently communicate with humans. So I have the dream. You know, the dream is inspired by, you know, so much science fiction um, about, you know, computers you can just sit down and say, hey, here's my problem. I want to talk to you about it. Can you read, you know, all this stuff and start explaining it to me so I can, I can do my research. You can amplify my creativity. You can enhance my understanding. You can dialogue with me like you, you're, you're, you're an expert you know, at this new topic I want to learn about. I mean, that's the dream. I've always wanted that. I've always, you know, I always thought it would have a huge impact on society. It would democratize expertise. Um, it would help us be better thinkers, faster, do faster research, enhance our creativity, our productivity, et cetera. And it's like, to me, that's always the role I wanted computers to play in my life and, and in society. And we weren't there. And 
Um, and so what was driving me was just desire to do that. And I actually sat down with some of the folks um, at Bridgewater and said, look, you know, we're, we're doing stuff together here, but this is kind of my, you know, my life stream. And, and ultimately I have to get back into this. And, uh, you know, just a pure scientific challenge that has to be part of my life is just pursuing that pure scientific challenge. As we talked about it, they were like, that's how we, that's the role we think machines should play too. <laughs> so, um, so we found an arrangement uh, that allowed me to actually start, uh, you know, elemental cognition and, and pursue that, pursue that, that dream. Um, I mean, there's lots of, you know, synergies in the way they're thinking and, and mutual, mutual benefit, but there was a real compatibility in, in the desire and, 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 and the basic approach. Okay. So let me get this right. So if I understand correctly, the mission that you have sort of postulated for yourself for elemental cognition is to create, in my understanding, like a mentor slash teacher kind of an AI that can sort of guide you through or introduce you and 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 uh, guide you through learning about any particular domain of knowledge. Is that fair? Yeah, to we, say? we we I mean the word we use is thought partner. Um, okay. you know, so I, I have this fluent thought partner that could speak my language, can acquire a tremendous amount of knowledge by learning and dialoguing continuously. And then when I sit down with it, I say, look, I need to understand more about this. Um, you know, I, I read this paper, I read this article, or I'm struggling with this problem. Can we just, you know, talk about it? Just as you would if you exactly went to a teacher or an expert in the field and started going back and forth about what the problem is and how to think about it, how to reason about it. So tell me then, because I remember you had a very particular, very smart, I would say brilliant, in fact, way of structuring the way you even approach the Watson challenge in terms of building your team. And so how, for example, you didn't uh, bring in any people who are interested in figuring out how human cognition worked because, you know, while that's an interesting scientific problem. It you must have reviewed our interview because uh, <laughs> you remember a lot of details. I, yes, yes, that's what I do. Of course, I do my best to prepare. So, <laughs> so, and, and that was that was brilliant because, of course, that, while that's a very interesting scientific issue, you know, you just went all out on solving a specific problem, which was narrower, of course, than how general human cognition works. But, right. And so, what kind of team building or structure? do you uh, have now in approaching this new challenge, this new mission that you're setting for yourself? So tell me a little about your team and what's the thinking about bringing those people together? What's so the expertise, fields, uh, et cetera? Yeah, so it's a great question. I think that um, one of the things, I don't remember if I had said this on, on the interview we did years ago, but one of the things I, I didn't want to do, I, I didn't want to sit there and start thinking about cognition and necessarily is like, again, this is why I think the criticisms that you mentioned before are legitimate in the sense that I didn't, you know, I wasn't going to sit there and say, I'm going to solve this problem the way a human would solve it. It's like, no, I'm going to take advantage of the techniques that they have today, like all the, the NLP and the statistics and the large corporate, I'm going to do whatever is necessary to, to see if we can get machines to do this. With elemental cognition, it's a little bit different because ultimately the goal is to get, in fact, to get the machine to reason in a way that's compatible and consumable by, the, uh, by human rationale, human cognition. So we do have to think about how humans think. We do have to think about how humans organize information, how they reason, how they understand, how they dialogue. So That's why I was setting you up the way I'm setting you up, because I was going to say, but you, now you do have to think about human cognition because we are part of that process, right? Teacher, student, or mentor, mentee, right? And if you don't understand how we perceive uh, uh, your future product, then even if it's brilliant, if it doesn't communicate with our type of cognition, we're not going to be able to benefit from it. Right. So there is more of a focus on human cognition. There's more of a focus on human learning. How do humans learn? How do they assimilate information? How do they balance their inductive, deductive, and abductive processes as they read and build their internal models? Uh, there is a focus on logic, reasoning, and representation. There is, of course, a focus on machine learning and statistical machine learning, but it's part of a hybrid architecture 
We don't currently have the expectation that we could take large corpora and we could train a model on how to uh, on you know on how to build consumable logical representations because we don't have that mapping in the data. People don't write language and then tell you exactly how to interpret it. Um, that goes on inside your head. So, you know, that's the kind of the, the, the approach we have. We have a hybrid architecture that we have people who are focused on dialogue and how people think and, you know, organize their communication. We have people thinking about how do they, how do they reason and, and formulate arguments uh, from, from a more logical reasoning and representation perspective. We have people who think about um, how to acquire data from large corpora using statistical techniques as well. We make use of a lot of the language modeling work that's coming out, uh, you know, of open a a AI and other places to complement, you know, that system. So it's very much, very much a hybrid architecture that connects all these pieces with the final goal to ultimately um, be embedded. And what we mean by be embedded is you're not going to learn how humans think and build a shared understanding without continually interacting with humans um, about how they read, what they read, and, and what they, how they infer um, from what they read, and how they talk about it. So it has to be embedded. Um, we focus on ensuring that ultimately that machine can not just answer questions about what it reads, but it can provide justifications. In other words, it can say, here's why I think this answer, or here's the information I'm missing and what I need in order to conclude an answer, or here are the contradictions I see. And then not only that, it should be able to answer, what was your process for getting there? Like you're telling me what the reasons are, but how did you come up with those reasons? So I should be able to provide provenance for that. So these are very demanding requirements. And ultimately, we are very aware of the classic knowledge acquisition bottleneck. So we know that the, that the overall system must be a learning machine. And it's going to learn both inductively um, through through large corpora, basically lots of data. Statistics, yeah. Statistics. But it's also going to learn directly from communicating with you and saying, here's what I'm thinking so far. What am I getting wrong about this? What am I missing? I'm going to go back and forth, extract that knowledge from you, and I'm going to bank that, and then I'm going to re reuse it. It's also going to learn directly from, you know, from, from reading as it gets better and better at reading. So, but, but go ahead. Isn't the challenge now precisely there? Because we have had amazing accomplishment on the statistical end of, of the equation, right? I even had somebody on my show who said, what is AI? AI is basically statistics on steroids today. That's what people call AI. But actually, so, so the, the, the actual deductive part of, of AI, where it actually learns something is, is the part where supposedly we're lagging behind. Is that true to say that that's the bigger challenge? Because with statistics, we've accomplished incredible stuff we never thought we would. And I mean, statistics, that's like a very flexible term I'm using here now. But, but, but basically, the point is that the learning part of the actual learning part of AI, what Marvin Minsky used to call that, you know, you can pull with a string and you can't push with it. You know, that's what he told me in the interview. Uh, like old school, if you will, things that he was thinking about the 1970s, stuff that the AI actually learns uh, and perceives uh, and, and, and deduces not function from the way a thing looks like, for example, right? So Gary Marcus talks about how his like four-year-old daughter could see a cheese crate and, and can sort of deduce that, you know, you can create the cheese or something like that. But AI is very far from de deducing that function from the form of the, of the tool, right? So is that where the challenge now lies? Yeah, I mean, the challenge lies in bringing these two things together, because on one hand, we, we know that we can't like hand code all this knowledge. We have to learn it. Uh, we can't have a, a, a room of knowledge engineers trying to encode all these different causal inferences. We ultimately have to be able to learn it and autonomously. And what I mean by autonomously is I don't I, I mean, without engineers sitting there and encoding it in brittle ways. Uh, but I don't mean 
um, without human involvement. In fact, there has to be human involvement because what the machine is building is a shared understanding that's ultimately compatible with, you know, the broad view of how the world works. So, um, so there has it, it is about engaging humans, but it's a it's about engaging them efficiently, and it's about using that engagement to build a capability, a cognitive cap cognitive capability that puts that machine in a position where it could do more and more in reading and interpreting and compounding its understanding with, with less and less um, need to engage humans. Just like uh, uh, when a human, we, we have this term at elemental cognition called natural learning <clears throat> to contrast it with machine learning. Again, this doesn't mean we don't use machine learning for inductive processes and we squeeze as much as we can out of large corpora. But natural learning means that Imagine how a human how a human learns. We start with simpler stuff. We read it. We ask a lot of questions. We build up our knowledge base. We try more complex stuff. We ask lots of questions. We get more and more autonomous until the point we become an expert. And now we can answer and reason without reading and asking many questions anymore. Right. So right. we become an expert. So it, it it parallels that sort of natural learning process that 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 it, that humans humans go through. And uh, we use reading and reading comprehension and curriculum-based learning as a, a paradigm to to test and evolve our system because we think it's a it's 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 an important um, like requirement that the machine that the machine behaves in a way that that we ultimately can understand and communicate with. Yeah, and and part of it is like kind of the nature of how we learn, if you will, which is again, connected to the previous conversation on human cognition, because let's say you have again, a four-year-old or a three-year-old child that sees a cat or a dog for the first time. They only need to see one or two cats or dogs. And then for the rest of their life, they're able to recognize a cat or a dog. With machines, you need like a billion cats and a billion dogs before, or billions, before you can able to kind of have some kind of a 90 some percent degree accuracy of, of cats and dogs, right? So the question is, how is it and is it possible to bring down that learning? Curve? Yeah, I mean, there may be a lot of, there may be, you know, I don't know for sure, obviously, but there may be a lot of priors in the structure of our brain that, you know, gets us to the right place faster in an example like that. But the, the example I like better it was, and this is from a personal case, it's like I remember when uh, my daughter was in the first grade and she was reading a uh, science text and there are some questions after and the science text was about electricity. And it's talking about how electricity is produced and it says something like electricity is produced by water flowing over turbines and blah, blah, blah. And then there's a question that says, you know, how is electricity created? And, and you know, she came to me and she said, look, that I mean, I know created and produced are synonyms, so I can go back and match this to the text and then answer the question, electricity is created by water flowing over turbines, but I really don't know what electricity is. I don't really know how a turbine functions. I don't know how water flowing over turbine actually produces this thing called electricity. I really have no idea what's going on, but I could probably get the answer to the question right. So that's a great example of essentially saying, look, I can use statistics and text matching and produce an answer that I'm probably going to get right. But my understanding is very impoverished here. Yeah. And just sort of knowing that your understanding is impoverished and what is even expected of an understanding in this case is kind of fascinating. And, and then how do you acquire it? And so we went through the process, you know, her and I, of – building a, a richer understanding of what electricity is and how it works and, you know, how it gets produced. Now, you can go deeper and deeper and deeper levels all the way into quantum mechanics, but at some level you draw the line and say, wow, I have a ri richer understanding and I can explain this in a way that's more satisfying. We want the machine to be able to go through that process um, on, on, whatever, on whatever topic and not consider the fact that it matched the text as a sufficient way to answer the question. Right, so in most ways, I mean, in, in all ways that I can think of, you're setting yourself a much more ambitious goal than Watson was, Much, right? more, much more so, much so, more so. So uh, I wanna ask you, uh, how big is your team uh, at Elemental Cognition? How what? 
How big is your team? How many people? Oh, I we're, know. About 20, we're about 25 people, right? We're about 25 people right now. I mean, like look, look, my philosophy is to, my philosophy is kind of do this in, in concentric circles, if you will. It was the same philosophy actually I had on Watson, which is, look, let, let's get, let's just get the people we need to kind of start knocking down the main barriers. And then where we see bottlenecks, um, we scale. So in other words, we, we say, okay, we think we got that figured out. We can go faster now if we apply 10 people to that problem. And that's when, you know, when we do it. So it's kind of a function of where we are in the journey, how many people you hire and where you position them. And yeah, so- I think, I, I think it's a great leadership lesson here, both in business, but also in science or in any other field here, the way you knocked out the Watson problem and now you're approaching similar to this. And, and the reason why I ask is because I remember that you had about the same number, 25 people or so at Watson. Um, so, but is there any structural difference? Because now you're setting yourself a much wider, much more ambitious goal. Watson was a very specific, easily measurable kind of narrower domain. So is there any structural differences the way you approach, approach the team building or the expertise uh, coming together between all those diverse there's fields? A diff- there's definitely a different focus, uh, a different balance of expertise. Um, we're lo- looking more into how do we ultimately represent the knowledge that needs to be consumable and fluently talked about by the machine? This was much less of an issue, you know, much less of an issue in the Watson work, more of a focus on cognition and human learning, much less of a focus, uh, you know, in, in the Watson work. There is, there's a harder challenge right from the get-go in, in the elemental cognition work in the sense that the metric in the Watson work was very straightforward. Yeah. The metric in the elemental cognition is not so straightforward. We, you know, we, in fact, we, we're making a bunch of progress on that. But even I just. I was going to ask you, what's the measure of success? <laughs> right. So even just establishing what it means to understand the text is, of course, you know, can be richly debated. So, you know, we, we, we actually are you know, working on a publication now related to saying, look, we have a proposal on what it means to understand the text. This isn't the be all and the end all and the only way to define it. But we think that it's the, you know, a fairly basic, you know, non-controversial way to say, look, if a human were to read a text, they'd be able to, you know, answer some basic questions. You know, what were the agents involved? What did they do? Why did they do it? When did they do it? Where did they do it? And what are the causal effects of their actions? So because if you had a human read a text and forget about the metaphorical reason, reason, all the other things they might get out of that text, they should at least be able to tell you that. Who, what, where, why, and when. Um, give me the relative timeline. Give me the relative spatial map. Give me the reasonable motivations for why people did what they did. Um, and be able to tell me that if, you know, what, what, what changes in state cause what other changes in state? You should at least be able to tell me that. That's your basic understanding. We are right now, these current techniques are far from doing that effectively um, on an arbitrary tax. And yet we would expect a human to be able to be able to do that. Otherwise, we would say you didn't understand what you read. Mm-hmm. So establishing, we call that the template of understanding, establishing that basic template of understanding, and then figuring out how do I measure, how do I um, encode and measure whether or not you got that right. And can I systematize that evaluation process? So that's something that, you know, you know, we had to do and we're working on iterating on as we're building a system that is implementing all those different components I talked about in the architecture, Mm -hmm. you know, from dialogue, representation, abductive, deductive, inductive reasoning, statistical, you know, machine learning, language models, now, one of the things that has helped us tremendously, where I didn't, ha- you know, didn't have to invest in mu- as much, is is being able to um, acqu- uh, acquire the shallower knowledge and then map it into the richer understanding by using language models, com- you know, coming out, you know, practically daily, more and more powerful language models, which are actually plug into our system and are very are are very helpful. But again, they're 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 just part of the problem, and. And you know the other interesting be, uh, behavior in our system is that 
If you give it a text, it should be able to go back and forth with you to produce a satisfying understanding, regardless of the background knowledge it has. It just takes longer and is more tedious. So in other words, imagine a teacher trying to teach a student Economics 301, and they had, and they had Economics 201. That should go fairly smoothly. If on the other hand, they're trying to teach a, a smart student, right, with the right cognitive capabilities, Economics 301, they had no economics before, you should be able to get there. It's just going to be longer and more tedious. Right. And that's sort of the behavior we, we want the system to demonstrate. And, 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 and then part of the challenge is not only because that sort of elemental or basic understanding of, of the actual text or knowledge domain is the first step, but then you have to flip it around and sort of communicate it back to the human in some kind of way that provides it in a step-by-step -step sort of like manner, uh, piece by piece, so that they can sort of get up to date to that. So, so that would be, I guess, the next benchmark. So is that correct? Yeah, and that's a big part of our system, the natural language generation component. And we talk about, we have these things called what we call elaborative summaries, which is meaning once I've developed an understanding, I can feed that understanding back to you in, in, in this elaborative summary, meaning I can give you the basics and anywhere you can click in and get answers to the questions, why do you believe, why do you believe that? What did you learn from this story? What did you learn from the background information that led to that conclusion? And I can continue to drill in uh, and and project the system's you know deep understanding of everything it's read, it's just like you would with you know a human. Like you know, if I read something, now I feed it back to you. But now I would fill in all the tacit information in the story and all the justifications for why I was how what logic I used to fill in that tacit information. And is there another step here uh, after that is done that I'm missing or? To close the loop towards your mission. Oh, I mean, you have ultimately you have to be able to build models. Uh, you know, again, you talk about theory of mind. What does the human I'm communicating with already understand? Uh, I have to understand their questions. They oh, that's the interactive part now. I Correct. see. I see. Correct. Brilliant. Yes. Yes. So there's at least three three major parts. And so my understanding is the way you're approaching that monumental challenges, you work them all in parallel. So different members of your team work on each of those simultaneously and sort of kind of like your... But it, all come, it all comes together in an interactive application. Yeah, that, that's that's brilliant. That's my precisely my point that this is a very sort of like leadership structural problem solving st uh, process or, or structural approach, if you will, right, which produces obviously uh, interesting results. But yeah, I mean, I th I, yeah, right. I mean, I, I think of it as like sort of leading and managing from, from the architecture down. And so you have people working in different pieces of the architecture. The architecture needs to continually come together and, and you're always looking at the holistic behavior. Uh, and, and in this case, the holistic behavior is an interactive system that works with a hum another human to produce an understand, to produce a shared understanding of a text. Yeah, because precisely, you can have the smartest people in the world, but if you don't have the right structure or process to harness that intelligence to synchronize together, you know, you're not going to get the results, apparently. Uh, so, but but where's the timeline fit within this? So, you have these monumental tasks ahead of you. Uh, and I remember with Watson, I think you told me you were aiming somewhere between three and five years, and you, you did it in about four. Uh, where is the timeline coming in with respect to uh, elemental cognition here and those? This, this, is, this is definitely a harder problem and um, you know, harder in some sense to make a prediction. Uh, you know, I'm happy with the progress we made. I think what I need to see before I can make you know, a more confident prediction is I need to see that that architecture will scale. And, what I, mean, and I don't mean like scale from a... Um, a performance perspective. What I mean is that, in other words, the learning process can 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 take off more autonomously, and we have to get to a point where our implementation of that architecture is sound enough that I can let this thing go, and I could see it start to read, dialogue, interact, bank knowledge, reuse that knowledge, and you know, rinse and repeat, and I can and I can see it learning, you know, in this curriculum style and asking less and less questions and requiring less and less interaction 
to produce satisfying uh, levels of understanding. We're not there yet. You know, we have some promising results, but we're not there yet. I think when I start to see that, when I start to see signs that that's going to scale, I can start saying, oh, wow, I can see us getting there in this amount of time or that amount of time. So we're right. still in the early stages. Right. So I, well, from what I understand from what you said is like you're not able yet to commit yourself to a sort of like a, a even a guess timeline of, of how things would progress. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, it would be an optimistic guess at this stage. I, I would I, I'm I'm anxious. Let me put let me put it this way. So by and large, I agree with what you said, but. But I feel like I should start to see that the signs that this thing could scale in the next couple of years, and then I and then I'm in a, and then I'm in a position where I could say, "Here's how long I think it's going to take to get where we want to get." Mm -hmm. Very very interesting. So let me talk a little bit about the black box problem because that's one of the also what looks like to me is a big difference between this one and Watson, right? Because with Watson, we especially at least the public did not care how we got there right the 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 the, the issue is can we get there people thought no we can't but we did uh, and then people didn't care how we got there they were just mind blown that we did get there now here what you're telling me i think is that you care a lot about understanding why things happen the way they happen or why it comes out with this solution or this proposal or suggestion or or whatever and and so you have to have a lot more of an open box instead of a black box approach and that creates i imagine a lot more uh sort of it's a bigger obstacle also to overcome here uh, yeah that's that's really the principal requirement is that you can produce um explanations for why you're coming up with the predictions or the answers that you're coming up with and as i said earlier not just not just why uh, so, for example, a you know, I'm reading this. I'm reading this text. I think so and so took this action for this reason. So here's my explanation for why they took the action. You know, here's because they wanted to achieve this goal, for example. But then I should also go more than that. I should be able to say, how did you come to that conclusion? So I want to be able to interrogate the the rationale for how you produce the explanation. So it could be, for example, well, in a in, you know in a previous text I had read this, I I I I, I interacted with fifteen hundred people, and the vast majority of them thought that in general here's how things work. I applied that rule, and that's why I concluded that X wanted to take that action for those reasons. So um, and that you know so it's very it's very demanding. Um, I think it's possible. I think we have a good approach, but yes, it's a very different. In fact, I think few people have this ambition today, and and um, and so this is the other thing we're trying to do. We're trying, we're trying to influence the AI community to say, look, this is. The, let's be honest. This is the real ambition we have for so many. When we think of AI and we think of general AI. Let's face it. This is really the ambition we have. It, like it may be that our. It, we we're not clear about how the techniques we're investing in are going to get us there today, but let's be honest, this is what we wanted to do. So is it then fair to call your project or your goal artificial general intelligence? Because it's definitely more general than the narrow Watson AI, but is it general enough? Because if you're attempting to create something that could go into any potential domain, learn, come and teach you or mentor you throughout this, that sounds very general to me. It's a, I'm wary of using the term because I think the term has an even broader uh, implication. Yes. Uh, you know, so, um, you know, can it learn any sort of thing? Can it, can it, you know, drive a robot and operate in the world um, in, a, in a physical sense? Like, so there's so many different aspects to intelligence, but to toward general intelligence, but it is certainly more, general than I think what we were trying to do with Watson and frankly, what I think many AI projects are trying to do today. It, it's certainly going toward, can I, can I read and understand arbitrary text, communicate with people about it, explain, you know, how I got there. So in that sense, it's, it's closer, I think, to that vision. Right. So let's, let's talk a little bit about the vision here. 
let's say not two years, because you said in two years you should have some problems, uh, pro progress. Let's say five, seven, ten years from now, you're successful. What's the greatest application of your uh, uh, of, of your product or the fruit of your labor, of that AI that you would create? What's the biggest application, the one that you see as your greatest vision, greatest reward or motivation or dream? You know, I mean, I, because I think it is a general, because I think it is a general technology, I think you can now apply, you know, you should be able to apply it to many domains. C clearly, the, the, when, when I think about, you know, where I, where I generally want the, mo the most help from a machine and where it seems to be most dramatic for people, you know, is in, in helping me as a, as a, as a, um, you know, as a patient in the healthcare space. I mean, I always sit there and think, yeah, I wish I knew more about this. I wish I, I, you know, I wish I had a machine would read all this stuff and explain it to me and help me understand what I, what, you know, what the alternatives are, what I'm facing, that kind of thing. I think anywhere where knowledge becomes critical to our day-to-day -day decision making and has tremendous weight impact on our lives, this is where we want that thought partnership. This is where we want that expertise. And that thought partnership and that expertise, particularly in the in particularly in the areas that are so um, important to us, is expensive. And yeah. so now I could sit there as a patient, but I could also sit there as a doctor, and I could get second and third opinions, thoughtful opinions that can justify their answers and explain their stuff. I mean, like you want that, but there are other areas you want that too. I mean, you want you know anywhere where it matters, you may want that in parenting, you may want that in finance, you may want that in in in, in legal issues, you may want that in in business, in business planning. Is there so, anywhere you don't want that, or is there any where that there are you're some, scared of? I think there are some areas. There are some, yeah. So I think there are areas where it's really scary not to have that. Um, sure. And medicine might be one of them. Yeah. Um, but, um, but I, but I think there are areas where it just doesn't mean that much to me. So for example, if you came and you told me that you can predict the weather with 85% accuracy, I don't really care how you're getting there. Well, if you're a farmer, you would definitely care, for example. Right. But, but my concern is more like this. Do you have any fear of someone taking your product, your fruit, the fruit of your labor? And let's say, says so so let, let me give you two two negative examples so one example would be teach me how to do an ied or let let's call him jarvis jarvis teach me how to do an ied or jarvis teach me how to make a biological weapon or Jar jarvis teach me how to do a nuclear weapon or the, the other alternative is like how do you feel if you imagine the fruit of your labor falling into some evil politician's hand? Like you can imagine Kim Jong Un, Kim Jong Il, or or I don't know. There's endless endless example Bashar al Assad. You know, there's others. So, how do you feel about that? Does that not give you a little pause or concern? Um. Maybe you say, Jarvis, tell me. My knee-jerk knee reaction, I shouldn't say my knee-jerk reaction because I've thought about this a lot. I mean, I just, I don't see that as, as a competitive threat, meaning like, I mean, you can go to YouTube and watch a video, a how-to video on almost any of these things, you know, today. Um, I think the, 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 the advantage isn't, the advantage of this technology isn't the how-to, it's really the the ability to engage in a rational thought process to make better decisions. Um, you well, know, let's say I'm Bashar al-Assad and I'm saying, Jarvis, tell me who is my, who are the leaders of my opposition and how I can deal with them in the most effective, efficient, fastest way that are, that's going to create the least amount of PR damage to my brand. <laughs> yeah, now that's a great question. And, uh, and it would be great to have expertise on that to kind of take you through the thinking about how to do that. And that's a really good, you know, I like that interaction. Um, like, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I err on the side of, you know, get the knowledge out there. Knowledge is king. Expertise is king. I think there's so much more good than, than bad that could come out of that. I think there's, you know, there, we have huge problems with, um, 
you know, it's a distribution of information that is that is arguably not rational, that is not well founded, that is not evidence based. We're not demanding enough from the information sources we have today. We're not demanding enough, frankly, even from each other on producing good rational explanations. If the machine, if the machine can raise the bar for uh, uh, for for that that rational dialogue process. Oh, I think the benefits will far outweigh the the, the concerns. Mm-hmm. Allow me to push just gently a little bit more here on sure. this point. Have you read Frank Herbert's Dune classic? No. No. Uh, anyway, there's a great new movie coming with uh, uh, director Denis Villeneuve. It's going to be here next uh, year uh, in two parts. And I understand it's supposed to be like, more amazing than Avatar. Anyway, at the beginning of Frank Herbert's Dune, which is one of the most impactful work of science fiction, you know, basically 16 things that Star Wars stole from them. And there's- Oh, like, you mean, oh, I'm sorry. I misunderstood. You said Dune. Dune, I, yeah. Frank oh, Herbert. Oh yeah, I'm sorry. I, I misunderstood. Yes, I'm familiar with Dune. Yes, go ahead. Right. So at the very beginning of Dune, Frank Herbert talks about the Butlerian Revolution or the Butlerian Rebellion. and yeah. and, and he talks about how and that's not a direct quote, but it's a very co- a close paraphrase. And it's in the very first page is how there were these people who decided to outsource their thinking to the machines because they thought that would set them free, only to find out themselves enslaved to other people with machines. Right. Yeah. So so what's the question? I mean, I like I... Well, the- I- the, I, the, I feel like if I feel like if we have a closed box systems, we actually do have that potential concern. I think, on the other hand, if the if the machines are easy to interact with, and can and can produce explana- and can produce explanations and can produce dialogues that are fluent and engaging, and and help us achieve higher levels of understanding, we're not at, at as much risk. So this goes back to the notion of am I creating an alien intelligence or am I creating a compatible intelligence? I think the risk for that is higher if you're creating an alien intelligence. I think it's lower if you're creating a compatible intelligence. Mm-hmm. Okay, so I'm going to come back to that in a different way, but but for a specific reason that hopefully would come to light, I'll bring it back a little later. So sure. last time we talked about um, the importance of meaning. And you said that at that time, um, computers or AI were good at sort of identifying meaning, but not creating it. Only humans were able to create that meaning. And you gave me this whole anecdote about Tchaikovsky's Sixth Symphony. I don't know if you remember. Yes. Um, uh, Which was brilliant uh, illustration of what you meant. Has your take on the creation of meaning changed? And... Let's leave it at that, and then I'll I'll do a follow up. So no, um, so no. I think me- meaning actually come comes from um, you know consciousness, and so when when our current techniques of generating me, me well from community and consciousness, right? So um, so that now now to be to be more precise, if 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 I if I sh- if I as- if I as a human assign meaning to a series of artifacts, whether they be paintings or whether they be words or whether they be um, symphonies, it is true that I can train a machine to generate si- you know similar or related artifacts that are likely to have similar related meanings. So a human will look at it and go, "Yes, that's one of those. I just created a an emotional symphony that has this and this this meaning to me." I've shown the computers a number of samples of this. They generated one, and yes, it captured that meaning. But again, the meaning, the, the source of the meaning was from, from, you know, from the human. And you don't see that changing? I don't see that changing. The reason is because meaning comes from the shared human experience of, of the world around us. Computers aren't human. They're not generating the same internal you know, uh, psychological and emotional features from the world around us. There's just a reality we have to accept. We share a tremendous, you know, a common biological base that that generates a lot of internal features that, in fact, we all share, emotional, psychological, you know, mental, um, uh, internal features. 
And from that shared experience, you know, we generate, you know, meaning. Um, a machine doesn't have that experience. It, it, it just doesn't process the world the way we do. It's not the same species. But if your AI is to communicate with humans and to be their mentor or their, quote, thought partner, then it stands to reason, I think, that it has to have the ability to establish a shared meaning with us in order it, to... It, 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 yeah, so, so it, it, is, it is building a representation of the meaning that the human community shares. It's not the source of that meaning. Mm-hmm. So it should do it should do an accurate job in representing that meaning. It should do an accurate job of being able to say, here's what I read, here's what I learned, here's who I talked to, here's how I reason that that this would mean that A would mean X to you, but I'm not the source of that. Right. And so is that why you have called in the past AIs super parrots? Because in a way that they are kind of reproducing or reflecting our meaning and at best enhancing it, but they're not the source of it. No, I mean, no. I mean, the main term, I, the reason why I use the word super parrot is because a, it, in that case, a parrot can't even, t- it can't even communicate your intended meaning. Uh-huh. It could okay. just tell you the next word it's going to repeat. Right. Um And I think that's more along the lines of what we're doing with statistical language models today. They can't even tell you the the intention. What They can't tell you what caused the language. They could tell you just what the next pattern is in the language. They can't actually tell you what caused the language, what the internal models are, and the logical reasoning ultimately resulted in the language. And that's like more like a parrot. Mm-hmm. So that's a slightly different point. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, I understand. And now we have had a number of sort of very high-profile people Uh, such as uh, Nick Bostrom, but more so Elon Musk, of course, who have, you know, warned us about, you know, Nick Bostrom's paperclip scenario. Uh, Elon Musk's version was like that EI is like, quote, summoning the demon or like strawberry fields forever, kind of where instead of paperclips, the AI turns the universe in strawberry fields forever, according to Elon Musk. How dangerous or probable or likely do you think that possible future scenario is? Because according to Elon Musk again, and a bunch of others, by the way, uh, Bill Gates have talked about uh, that. Steve Wozniak have talked about that. Uh, so for, for Elon especially, it's like the biggest challenge, the greatest danger that humanity uh, is facing. Uh, uh, Noam Chomsky on my show said that That's totally science fiction, and it's only a diversion from the real problems that we're facing today, like, for example, climate change and so on and so on. Whereabouts do you stand on that dispute? I'm probably closer to, to Noam Chomsky on that. Um, I, 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 I'm not as worried about, about those things. I think there are concerns, but I think the concerns that I have are more related to to the leverage, the, the physical leverage we give uh, machines. So in other words, and not because the machine intelligence is, is going to run rampant, but rather that humans can get, it can interfere with machines. We've given tremendous physical leverage and can wreak havoc. So example, if we, if, if, everything, if our power grids are electronically controlled and could easily be hacked, if we have a smart, you know, smart driving, uh, autonomous driving network that can easily be hacked and all, you know, and, and all the cars can be turned into weapons. Um, these, these things could potentially be catastrophic if not engineered carefully to protect them against, you know, malintent. Um, I don't have this view that the that the intelligence is going to go so dramatically awry that it starts doing crazy things. I think that's actually easier to manage and easier to control than it is to control the humans hacking into these systems that have tremendous physical leverage. I agree with Noam that like we have a lot of big, I mean, whether it's climate change or the implications of of you know genetic engineering on humans and and screwing with human dna and all the implications of that. i mean there's just so many big problems we have i just don't think you know the fear of the of the ai taking over is uh is on the top of the list 
Yeah, to be honest, after doing 250 of these conversations, that's kind of where I've evolved to be. Like when I started 10 years ago, I considered that to be a very uh, substantial issue. Now I don't even see it in the top five, to be honest, in terms of danger from AI. What I think is the danger is the humans, actually. Right. Uh, and, and that's why uh, I like I've came up with I've come up with the metaphor that that uh, technology in general and artificial intelligence in particular is basically a magnifying mirror. It is a mirror because, as you said, it doesn't create a meaning, or, or as I would say, is it doesn't have an essence of its own, but it merely reflects the essence that we put in it or the meaning that we put in it. But it's magnifying because it provides this enormous leverage points that it magnifies and amplifies the effects tremendously, right? So so therefore, it's not so much about the mirror, but it's more about what you're putting in it to begin with. And that's not coming from the mirror itself, but it's coming from us. That's and that's right. why I'm more concerned about us. And that's why going back to that quote from Dune, I think that's a very reasonable quote to say that people who outsource their thinking to machines in the hope that that would set them free found themselves in, in the Dune case right. enslaved to other people with machines. Right. And, and, and then that's why I think that that's the more likely scenario. And, and of course, you can talk about obviously not on that scale, but about manipulation with like Brexit, you know, the, the US elections, all kinds of other issues around where, you know, very narrow AI uh, and statistics, alg algorithms, big data come together to manipulate humanity in one direction or another. Yeah, I mean, I, th I, th I think that I think that is a concern and, um, and it, that we that is an important one today, which is Again, the technology allows you to amplify the manipulation of information. I mean, information has been manipulated it's like forever. Yeah. Um, but the 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 power of machines allows you to amplify the manipulation of, of that. That's that's. I think that's a that's a real concern. I I think the ease at which you can segregate populations by feeding them the information that they want to hear. And not and and rather than ensuring that they keep an open mind about things and they hear both sides, wow. And again, but what's driving that ultimately? Like I I believe what's driving that is not just fanatical politics. It's actually economics. Um, you know, if I if I keep giving people what they want to hear, they keep clicking. Um, it's hard. You know, cognitive strain is hard. Getting someone to expand their mind is harder. It's less comfortable giving them something they're familiar with that they already believe is easy. And if I keep clicking, I keep, I, you know, I, I keep uh, cashing in. So that's a hard problem. That's, that's where, again, I don't need super advanced AI to, to, to do that, honestly. Um, yeah, but let's imagine your, uh, your product, uh, which is uh, brilliant in so many ways and, and very ambitious. Uh, how do you get rid of that? inherent human bias that we're all subjects to. Uh, uh, because let's say someone, let's say you are even able to get rid of the bias, but then as you point out the danger of hacking, someone comes in and embeds a bias into Jarvis so that he doesn't go and learn a domain from an impartial objective point of view and teaches you the right or the, the truthful ways of things are, but gives you this slanted, skewed, point of teaching and directs you and manipulates you towards a specific conclusion that serves the purposes of those who kind of hacked into Jarvis or something. And then you say, look, I conversed in, with this Jarvis AI and I learned, but actually it was manipulated all through and through because you did, uh, depended entirely perhaps on it. Yeah. So, I mean, I think for me, the difference between the approaches are important. So. What I'm what I'm hoping and expecting is that, you know, with with um, by the way, we don't call it Jarvis, we call it Clara, but whatever. Um, <laughs> my bet, my bet. <laughs> but my uh, bet. but um, I think the I, I I think the promise with Clara is that you have the opportunity to say, why do you believe that? Um, where did that come from? And the answer isn't shouldn't be, hey, look, I mean, I you know, that's just what it is. Rather, here's the rationale behind it. Here's the evidence. You decide for yourself. So, and and I have to design systems that 
allow for that, that enable that possibility. I can give you a rational justification for what it is that I'm, what it is that I'm saying. Yeah. And I have to be open to being probed by the human. Now, granted, yes, I understand the human might not probe. Um, but this is kind of where the opportunity is to kind of raise the bar, because if you start having a, a, a capability of responding well to that sort of probing, then that might become an expectation. So if 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 your if your website just was a bunch of words, but it was actually something that that could say, here's why I think what I think, um, here's my explanation, here's my data, ask me questions about it. Wow, that sets a much higher standard, right? And 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 that starts to become an expectation. What do you mean you, you just got, you didn't ask a question? You didn't challenge it? What do you mean you didn't challenge it? Right? <laughs> right now we just get the stuff and we don't challenge it. Yeah, that's why I, I've actually written in the past, uh, it's been now a number of years, about uh, the importance of questions because the world is transformed by asking questions. Uh, and I think it was Pablo Picasso, he said, computers are very stupid because they can only give you answers. And it takes real intelligence and perhaps that's where our humanity is uh, sort of uh, ad advantage, maybe a temporary one, but at least so far lies is, is in the uh, asking the, the right questions and which set the direction. And if you look at it even historically, uh, we have kind of consistently more or less either similar or even the same questions throughout time, but every epoch provides different answers. And every time when those answers get updated and upgraded, we have a revolution be it a political or social or industrial, some kind of a revolution, right? And so it basically turns out that the questions actually have much bigger, better longevity than the actual answers, right? And so I even came up with this kind of Socratic test of artificial intelligence, where in contrast to Turing, it's not about the answers that the AI gives you, that lets you judge how intelligent it is, but it's about the kind of questions that the AI, ask, the AI can ask as, as, a, as a test of its own intelligence. What do you think of that idea? So I, I, I think, you know, I by and large agree with that, you know, very strongly. I think that, you know, if, if a system's, if we think about, when we think about human interactions, we start judging someone else's intelligence um, very quickly based on what kinds of questions they're asking. Right, we we actually sometimes have less of a signal when they just spit out an answer because, for all we know, they're repeating the answer from someone else. Like, but when they start asking questions, well, what do you mean by that? Are you trying to figure out this, or are you trying to figure out that? Because if I were to go this way, this way, then I would I would conclude this. When you start having a dialogue like that, you you can now say, wow, I, I can align my understanding with this person's understanding. I can judge their thinking process. And the machine with which they're using, in other words, the process in which they're going through to arrive at the answer, that's more of a sign to us of their intelligence than they just happen to be right on the answer to that question. And in fact, that's a driving thing for the, you know, elemental cognition, how we're building Clara is, Clara asks lots of questions and explains why it's even asking those questions. So it says, look, I'm trying to figure out this. Here's what I don't know. Can you help me with this? And then when you give an answer, it probes back and says, so are you saying that this is true, right? Puts it in its own words kind of thing. And I think that is a, a, a deep sign of, of, of intelligent behavior. But, um, and again, compatible intelligence. Like it's a, very hard to have, have that conversation with an alien intelligence. Mm -hmm. and, and those are all brilliant questions and I love this, but, but, but because we're talking about hopefully eliminating biases, let me ask the question here about sexual bias, because here's the thing. We have Siri. We have Ray Kurzweil's Ramona. We have Alexa. We have, I think her name was Faye. And now you're telling me Clara. All female <laughs> names, right? So it's not Jarvis, it's Clara. Aren't we kind of reinforcing, and there's been one of the criticisms that, and, and you know, it's a very fair criticism towards my show that, you know, unfortunately, 85% uh, of my interviewees are male uh, and usually white uh, and only about 10 to 15% are females. My wife is merciless on me about that. And, and, and people have pointed out that, that, you know, calling her Clara 
carries a lot of, you know, cultural and historic biases with respect to women and their position in our society, which may not be desirable for us to try to reinforce in the future. So do you feel that's a fair criticism? And why do you call her Clara? This stands for a collaborative learning and reading agent. Mm -hmm. But still kind of feminine. I mean, like, right. So... And so, when just... it out, so when it's spelled out, so when it's spelled out, Clara, it was like bonus. <laughs> right. But, but, but of course, you know, a feminist critic of that would be like, that was probably a bunch of white guys naming that, that AI sitting on a table in a conference room. And, and of course, when it. Actually, it was just one white guy. It was me um, <laughs> you know, literally sitting there and, you know, this is, I think of this as something that collaboratively reads and so, and learns and so. Um, look for an acronym. Um, yeah. So anyway, uh, look, I, I, I don't know how to think about about that particular bias. Honestly, I, I didn't put a lot of thought into that one way or the other. I actually did just formulate an, a neat sounding acronym. Um, yeah, I don't know what 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 is the concern exactly? I mean, if that with regard to the, the AI. The concern is that you know the idea was that women are traditionally, especially sort of mid twentieth century, fifties, seventies, they're good for just like being assistants, right? So whether it's Alexa, whether it's uh, Clara, whether it's Ramona for Acre, oh, oh, they're oh, all I just see. denigrated to that level where they're becoming your secretaries. Oh, and I therefore, see. that's as well, pres prescriptive as it is descriptive. I, I see what you're saying. And it denigrates well, we women. We, we certainly don't see, the, you know, again, we call it internally, we call it that because the application collaboratively reads with you and, and learns and stuff. But um, we don't see it as, an, as um, an assistant. In fact, the word we use is a thought partner. And in fact, as I had mentioned earlier, we see it as an expert or, or as a teacher or as an expert lawyer, as an expert doctor or that kind of ultimately that kind of notion. So I never really I, I agree that if you're talking, you're saying a Siri schedule an appointment for me. I see your point, but that's not where we see our system at all. We see our system going hey, help me solve this problem. Like, I'm clueless. So I think we're positioning, regardless of the name point that you're making, uh, I think the more important point with regard to how we view this technology is we view this technology as, in many ways, a, a superior intellect that's going to help us work through problems. Well, that's good. That's good. And if, if you, if the perception is in the public perception ends up being that it's a superior intellect, that, that well, could actually I mean, help. Well, I mean, that's, 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 what I'm trying to do, right? I basically, like I said, we're trying to raise the bar on yeah. what it means to read, understand, dialogue, deliver, democratize expertise. I mean, this is a very different thing than, you know, give me a reminder or look this thing up for me. This is help, you know, help me understand this better. Mm -hmm. So uh, you ask uh, uh, Clara, uh, What's the meaning of life, the universe, and everything? <laughs> yeah. it, would, it would probably say, what do you mean by meaning? Um, here are the alternatives. <laughs> but, um... Six million years later. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you know, um, so I, I, you know, I think it, it, you know, working through, working, working through the meaning of things. It's, a, it's just a very interesting, you know, uh, challenge to to take um to build to build what i call that shared understanding so it's sort of it, it it's it's sort of interesting to think about when you look at the dialogue that emerges from this approach it very much put tries to put the human and the machine kind of at this peer-to-peer -peer level where it's like look we're working together to build this shared understanding you may know more than I do, but if we're gonna if we're gonna collaborate and, and build this thing, then I have a lot of questions. You need to help me. I can help you, but you need to help me because in the end, we're gonna we're gonna rely on that on that shared understanding. So it's it's very and that again that goes back to like this notion of collaborative learning. You know, we're gonna learn together is is the way we think about it. Mm -hmm. 
Excellent. Fantastic. Well, David, uh, we've been talking uh, for about 86 minutes, so we only have about three or four minutes left of our interview. Where can people find more about you and your work? Probably the, be the best thing to do is look at our website, um, elementalcognition.com. Fantastic. And of course, I'm going to link to it, but I just wanted you to say it. So we've been talking, as I said, for 86 minutes, we covered a diversity of topics, sort of, we came up to date with everything that happened since Watson today, and we kind of speculated about the future and the pros and the cons and the dangers of uh, what your work and other people working in the same business can expect to see and the probabilities thereof. What do you want to be the, the major message, the most important thing that our viewers and listeners take away from this 90-minute conversation with you today? I think the, the, you know, the main thing is that uh, is to raise the bar for what our expectations of AI when it, when, when it comes to artificial intelligence really producing an understanding of the world around us and an ability to produce a consumable, interactive, and fluent intelligence is to be honest about what our expectations are. Don't let the technology and what it can do drive the expectation. Let our imagination drive the expectation. Let our imagination drive the expectation. That's a fantastic message. Actually, you know, it connects very much with, I've written in the past about how technology is the, the, the how and not the why and the what, because it's a tool and the why and the what comes from us and technology is just the how. So I've argued that you can have the best possible how, but if you screw up the why or the what, you're going to end up doing more damage than good. And, and now you're saying kind of reinforcing that by saying that let your imagination drive. Uh, uh, how did you say it? In other words, let, let our, our imagination drive the expectation of, for what AI is and what it does for us, right? Exactly. Rather than saying, hey, I have this technology that does this, so that's where I'm going to make my investment. Back up and say, well, what do we really want out of it? Exactly, and that the why. Exactly. So we set the why and the what, and then, then we figure out what is the technology that allows us to best right. accomplish this why and the what. Brilliant. I love it. Well, Dr. David Frucci, thank you so much for catching up with us seven and a half years later. I really love talking to you, and I wish you good luck and all the best. And hopefully for another five years down the road, we'll play catch up again and see where we're at with uh, Clara. Excellent. Thank you so much. And yeah, I was going to say, let's not wait another eight years. <laughs> Let us not. Thank you so much. If you guys enjoy this show, you can help me make it better in a couple of ways. You can go and write a review on iTunes, or you can simply make a donation. 